Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday service. It's lovely to be together to remember our Saviour's death on the cross. Let's stand together and sing a beautiful Easter hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. voices, those that love Jesus, sing beautifully. We're going to have God's Word read responsively right now. I'll read verse 1 and you join in in this verse 2 and so on. So the bold verses are the ones that you will read. 
Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. This is God's word. We're about to join together to celebrate communion. So let's sing these words as we pre prepare for that.
as we come to communion, uh, if you don't have one of these cups and you'd like one, stewards are around and will help you. So just raise your hand. We all good? Cool. Uh, before Golgotha, before Gethsemane, Jesus' last meal with his disciples was the Last Supper. It's recorded in the 14th chapter of Mark's Gospel. And today, Christians all over the world are pondering the most extraordinary event in history, that man would kill God. And today and the next few days, Christians all over the world will be fussing about the meal, the seating at the meal, and the buns and the eggs. Let's hold on to the more important things. Mark writes, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the, my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so we too will eat and drink together. Whether this is your home church or whether you're visiting with us today, and if you are, I welcome you. Either way, this is for those who love the Lord. It's something we have in common with fellow believers across the world, across the ages, and across different traditions of Christian practice. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. His body was broken for us. We can peel back the top piece of plastic uh, to get to the wafer. And I invite you to eat that in your own time. And then peel back the next piece of plastic to access the juice. And we'll hold the cup and drink the juice together. Jesus' blood was shed for us. Now we're going into a brief time of reflection and personal prayer. While they were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. Why did Ju Judas do it? We don't know. Maybe he had become disillusioned with the type of Messiah Jesus had become. Let's now quietly pray. Are there any ways in which Jesus has disappointed your expectations? Do you dare to talk honestly with him now about how secretly you feel disillusioned?
He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. How do you view Jesus? Is he your constant guiding light or a last option in a crisis? Could you tell him now how you view him? Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Are you carrying a sadness in your soul? Our Saviour is offering you God's peace. Cast your cares on the Lord now. Thinking now of someone who themselves are experiencing a sadness or other difficulty, pray now that they may experience God's presence in the darkness and his mercy in this Easter season. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Lord, we confess we fall well short of the way you'd have us live. Show us now ways where we have strayed from your path or failed to trust completely in your truth. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Lord, we thank you when we confess our sins. You are faithful to forgive us. We thank you. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. You are good to all and compassionate to all including us. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to open uh, your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. Uh, if you're looking in the Pew Bible, that's on page 1010. Mark chapter 15, and we're going to be reading from verses 25 to 32. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews... They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. 
Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. This is God's word. Continue the Bible reading for Mark chapter 15, starting from verse 33 to 41. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, nama sapatini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on the staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw what he, 
how he died, he said, Surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James of the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, this woman had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to, Je to Jerusalem were also there. This is God's word.
the beauty of the cross. Do we see it? The one who died, a death like no other. Of course, we can't see the beauty of the cross if our eyes have not been opened to the fact of the cross. And there are people still today who out of ignorance, deceit, background, not having a full understanding, who still claim, oh yes, no doubt Jesus died, but not on that cross. That is just a matter of fiction. There's no evidence for it, they will cry. Well, the Roman historian Tatusus in 112 AD, he talked about the death of Jesus by Pontius Pilate. The Jewish writings, for example, the Talmud and the Sanhedrin talk about Jesus' death upon the cross. There's eyewitness accounts in the Gospels with respect to Jesus' death upon the cross. And one of the keys is that the Gospels tell us that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And those of us who have any understanding of the law would appreciate that you don't give that kind of detail or data unless you want this centred in history. Joseph was identifiable. Arimathea was a small town. He was a member of the Jewish ruling authority, the Sanhedrin. It's saying like Ross Clifford at Castle Hill Baptist buried Jesus. You could contact him, trace him, identify him. The same with Nicodemus. This is centred in history. You don't give that fact and data if the cross is not essential. Islam will say in the Quran, no, Jesus was taken up to heaven out of respect, they think, for Jesus. There can be no beauty in the cross. This prophet must have escaped death by going up to heaven without death. Or perhaps someone died in his place. Others will say, like Dan Brown, in New Spirituality, no, 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 he didn't die on the cross. There's no beauty in a death upon the cross. Where the beauty lies is he faked his death upon the cross and then went off and started a new movement in France or somewhere else, but he didn't die upon the cross. All of that scepticism, alternative answers, even if wishing to be respectful to Jesus, are denying the historical reality and the beauty of the cross. And how could he swoon upon the cross? We've seen over this Easter period that after Jesus was convicted falsely, he was whipped. And we know the Roman whips had leather strands with metal balls upon it and he'd be whipped to the point of death. And as we saw the earlier slide, consistent with Jewish practice, he would carry his means of execution on a resurrection walk that actually began with death. And he was so, so burdened by the cross he was carrying. Physically, someone else carried it for him. And then, of course, you hang on a cross until you suffocate. That's why you keep on pushing yourself up. And that's why... In some sense, it's an act of grace that the Romans come and break your legs 
so you can no longer push yourself up to breathe and you die. But in Jesus' case, he'd already died and to make sure they put a spear into his side and they took him down and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who you can check out, buried him. As one great sceptic of yesteryear said, to believe that Jesus somehow swooned his death, that somehow he was placed in the grave but not really dead and somehow he revived himself or the aid of others in the tomb revived him and from that he walked out of the tomb and said, he is risen. As Strauss himself, a sceptic, said, that scenario is a greater miracle than actually the resurrection itself. Don't deny the beauty of the cross. Jesus is upon it. He's dying. He dies. A cruel death. And he dies in human history. But also, we don't see the vision of the cross, the truth and beauty of the cross, unless we have a tunnel vision with respect to to the cross. Why did he have to die? Of course, to fulfill prophecy. And the prophecy we've heard from Isaiah 53 and elsewhere about his death and what he would go through. But why did Jesus have to die? Because he died a death of liberty. He died a death of liberty to liberate us from what binds us and holds us back. And we only see that if we understand it's a tunnel vision, like going through a tunnel. We need to keep to the very end of the tunnel until we see the full beauty of the story of the cross. Don't exit. Don't go off after one particular aspect of that beauty. Go through the tunnel. And as we go through the tunnel eyes fixed, do we see the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the cross is that he liberates us. He liberates us from suffering, suffering alone, the spiritual woes, the spiritual temptations, the the spiritual difficulties that we have. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. There are times we think our spiritual journey is too much. There are times we might feel that standing up for Christ is too costly. There are times that we might feel that the temptations that are coming our way are overwhelming. There are times when we feel that we are facing the ultimate, ultimate test of death and trust in God. That can I see myself and loved ones through this particular situation. Well, the cross reminds us that in the person of Jesus, there is no grief, no temptation, no struggle, no denial, no abuse that our heavenly friend cannot relate to. And as we approach the throne of grace, We do so through the Lord Jesus Christ and we do so seeing the one upon the cross who understands every aspect of our life. But he also came to liberate us and die upon the cross to liberate us from a loveless existence. As we said earlier in the year, John 3.16, it's a verse for Christmas, it's a verse for Easter. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Love so amazing, so 
divine demands my soul, my life, my all. In the cross we see radical love, which we've sung about this morning. As John Updike, the great Lutheran novelist, and you'll see in your uh, news that came out uh, yesterday or today, you'll see that I include for me what is the best Easter poem that I know, and it's his seven stanzas of Easter. Go home, read it, the seven stanzas of Easter. John Updike, the novelist, was asked why all his characters resonate with the readers because he said all of his characters are radically valuable but radically imperfect and we relate to that and when we see this truth that God loved us so much we know, I know I'm valuable, I'm loved. If the most significant person in the universe sees me as someone he would put his son upon the cross for in order that I might have eternity with him. What incredible love. He didn't do it out of duty. God did it out of love. And I believe that when we understand that love, the immensity of that love, then nothing can separate us from our trust in God. But he also came, as we see in the cross, to liberate us from an aimless life. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, we read in Mark 10, 45, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And almost universally across this country, that beauty of the cross is understood. It's seen every Anzac Day. Australians know that the mark of true humanity and true courage and true love to your friend and neighbour is to lay down your life, to be a servant for others. I was um, in a taxi in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago and uh, if you've been in taxis in Washington, D.C. or New York or whatever you know, you're going to meet people of all sorts of different nationalities and backgrounds. And uh, this taxi driver told me that he was from Ethiopia. And he said, where are you from? I'm trying to identify your accent. I said, Australia. Well, I think I was going to get a free taxi ride because he just went on and on about the number one woman in Ethiopia, Catherine Hamlin. And we know her story, don't we? There's a ferry, hopefully still operating in Sydney, but certainly you'll see it in the shows, named after her, the Hamlin Ferry on our harbour. She is the one who went to Ethiopia to open hospitals for women, Fitula, and she could, after birth, ensure that they could go back to the village and through this simple operation, they would be seen as acceptable and as humanity in these villages that would separate them out because of what was happening to them. And so thousands of people, thousands of women, were restored through her ministry. It's interesting to note that in all of that, she and her husband basically died in Ethiopia. She, after 50 years of ministry. And here's a taxi driver in Washington, D.C., telling me about our most famous Australian. Wasn't a sporting hero wasn't a Prime Minister, it was Catherine Hamlin. The beauty of the cross, it shows us that we are to be people who lay our lives down for others. But the beauty of the cross is also that it liberates us from evil. Colossians 2.15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, the evil forces, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Easter is just not about us, it's just not about Pilate, it's not just about the Jewish leader's response, it's about a battle with the devil himself. And the cross says, he is defeated. Evil, evil is defeated. I've shared with you before that the symbol of the empty cross in the early church primarily picked up this particular theme, which was 
what we call Christus Victor, a very early theme of the church. And that was that when they planted a cross on a piece of land or on a building or whatever, they were declaring that Christ is Victor here. That through his death, evil has been trampled. That through his death, this is a place that is now sacred and renewed. He died upon the cross to liberate us from sin and its consequences. Friends, there's all different shades that we can see of the beauty of the cross. But if we see all the others and miss this, for Christ also suffered once for sins and the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, and some people will say, oh, no, we can't talk about sin in modern day society. Well, that's, that's so false. Australians understand sin and are happy to speak about sin. They know it in their own life. As Russian dissident and Nobel Prize winner Solzhenitsyn wrote, the line dividing good and evil cuts through every heart. Sherlock Holmes said to Dr Watson, the vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. Or we all know John Newton, the converted Atlantic slave trader that upon his conversion wrote, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was blind, but now I see, was lost, but now I am found. You can sing that song at a mind-body-spirit festival, at an Anzac Day service, in a school, RSL club, and they will sing of the wretched man like me. Newton used that. Upon that cross, Jesus bore the sins of the world. He bore them upon his shoulders. He took that sin. And as we are all mindful, the uniqueness of what we proclaim in Christian truth is, this beauty says, this beauty of the cross says, it's no longer my performance, it's no longer my deeds, it's no longer my running up the hill backwards and whatever to somehow appease God with respect to my sin, my failures. It's no longer having to be in a world of self-help, trying to make myself better that I might be acceptable to God, it is done in the cross. Jesus took my sin upon the cross. And so when God sees me, he doesn't see my unrighteousness, says Peter. He says, Jesus, his righteousness, his purity. Oh, the beauty of the cross. And one of the ones that I am finding more significant for our age is the beauty of the cross. It liberates our minds. Hebrews 9.14 How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness, consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. One of the things that we experience pastorally is often people, including ourselves, while they grasp the message and the beauty of the cross, still live with a conscience that constantly convicts them of their unworthiness or their failure or the fact that they could never be acceptable to God. And if you are in that situation, what we hear is that the blood of Christ liberates our conscience removes our conscience. Pray to God that the forgiveness and the liberty that we know in Christ is experienced in our mind and our spirit and our being. It cannot hold us back. And if you are struggling in that regard, just remember AJ who said here a couple of weeks ago, a man in jail for murder, now one to Christ, liberated. He understands the beauty of of the cross, not even that action can screw his mind. And then 
one that I think we must always face. The beauty of the cross, it liberates us from God's rightful anger. God presented him, we see in Romans 3.25, as a sacrifice of atonement, or as the one who would turn aside his wrath through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Go home and read Romans 3.25. What's happening on this cross? What's happening in the beauty of the cross? We see the love of God, that he loves us so much. We see the healing of our consciences. We see that we have a Christ who has experienced all and we can go to him in our prayers. We can see that we are people of servanthood. We can see that our sins have been taken. But something more is happening upon the cross because God is not only a God of love, God is a God of justice. And he expresses his love, the beauty of the cross, he expresses his love to us. But what about his justice? What about a world of sin and blackness? What about that justice that God still deals with in his wrath and anger? What happens there? Well, the beauty of the cross, he asks us to do nothing about it. He answers that himself. He offers his own self through his son to be our sacrifice. So his justice, his justice is answered. That's absolutely remarkable. And that's why Jesus my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not only on that cross for my sin. He's not only on that cross for the sin of the world. He's on that cross to satisfy the rightful justice of God. And at that moment, carrying the sins of the world and understanding that he is there satisfying the justice of God the Father to make us one with him forever. Darkness. Darkness. There could be no bleaker hour. John Stott puts it this way, thus God took his own loving initiative to appease his own righteous anger by bearing it in his own self, in his own son, when he took our place and died for us. Nothing crude here, nothing to evoke our ridicule. It's profound of holy love to evoke our worship. It is finished. It is finished. The beauty of the cross can only fully be understood, even our dimly earthly limitations, if we acknowledge the truth of the cross. Don't try to hide from the truth or think we can give a better story, the truth of the historical cross. But at the same time, it's like a tunnel. To see the beauty, we need to go all the way through the tunnel to see all that is being said. Uh, two guys that might be known to some of you, John Piper and Alastair McGrath, give the kind of illustration to understand the beauty of the cross. It's like light going through a glass prism. And as light goes through the prism, you see the white light. And when it goes through the prism, constituent colours come out. You know, red, orange and whatever. Yeah, they come out. They're in there. They come out as the light goes through the prism. And sometimes we just see the white light. We just see the cross. But we don't put the cross through the prism of the Bible and our theology to see all the beauty, all the beautiful colours that are actually in that white light, that are actually in that cross. It's like a rainbow. You drive out of the tunnel and there is a rainbow, all those colours that shows the beauty of the cross. Not just that wooden piece, but all the colours that come when that piece is examined and understood. This Good Friday, 
And it is good. It's good because of what it represents, the beauty, the beauty of the cross. Will we have that tunnel vision? Will we go all the way with Jesus? All our understanding of the cross and the richness of it, understanding ultimately it's there we find forgiveness of sin, right with God, peace with him forever. We're going to sing together one of the more modern hymns today that truly reminds us of the beauty of the cross. Let's stand.
Father, if any of us here today do not know or have experienced the power of the cross, I would pray that your word and your spirit would convict so they may see the beauty, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ upon that cross. And Father, as we go, walking in the power of the cross, we come again on Sunday knowing that the story is not complete. We come again on Sunday to hear and understand that the power of the cross is truly powerful because he has overcome, overcome death. So, Father, thank you. We bless you. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us, each and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.